How's everybody doing? Wow, are we going to have a depressing evening. <laughs> Hopefully not too depressing. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make one announcement. I'm sure that many of you in this room uh, were very much looking forward to uh, Reverend uh, Dr. William Barber's talk that had to be rescheduled. Well, it has been rescheduled uh, for Thursday, October 11th. Uh, almost everyone who bought tickets for that has uh, had the situation uh, resolved. There are some people, though, that haven't. If you bought tickets to that, you will get your money back, but you have to buy the tickets again. Uh, and, and so keep that in mind if you want to see uh, the Reverend Dr. William Barber and what an urgent moment we're in to have that voice here uh, in Santa Fe. Uh, again, Thursday, October 11th. Given that I think we're, we're going to have uh, some dark moments this evening, uh, Nikhil and I both, neither of us are famous for, uh, you know, being the most hopeful people in the world. Um, I, I wanted to share with you as I, as I uh, came in today, as I flew into Albuquerque, I was remembering, I had a kind of flashback because I passed by the, the gate uh, of the last time that I was in Santa Fe. Uh, I flew out of Albuquerque on, I, I think it was like a 6.30 flight, uh, so I had to drive from Santa Fe to Albuquerque. And I remember I was standing in line, it was a Southwest flight going to LA. And I was standing in line, you know, they have the things where like numbers one through 20 are here, number, you know, two through 5,000 are here. And I was, you know, so I'm standing there and the first person in the line for like the A group was the actress Kira Sedgwick, uh, who's married to Kevin Bacon. Um, and I just noticed that she was there. It's, I'm not the kind of person that's gonna go up and say anything to somebody like that, but I just noticed that, okay, so Kira Sedgwick is there. So she gets out of the plane before everybody. She had like some uh, uh, sheriffs with her. So she gets, I guess that's what happens when you're famous. They, uh, so she gets escorted onto the plane. It's sort of like the opposite of when you're a Muslim where the sheriffs come to take you off a plane. The sheriffs come to take the famous white lady onto the plane. So anyway, she gets on and then like, I'm in like, you know, group X. And then we, we get on and, but there happens to be a seat right next to Kira Sedgwick that's open. So I just, I sat there. I didn't choose to sit next to Kira Sedgwick. I end up next to Kira Sedgwick. By the way, Patrick, I promise you this is going somewhere. Um, so... So the flight takes off, and, uh, and we're in the air, and it was so early, like the entire flight is asleep, but I, was, I had to give a speech when I got into LA, so I'm, I had my laptop open, I was on the internet, I was working, and, uh, and I was in an aisle seat, and Kira Sedgwick was on the aisle seat next to me. I didn't say anything to her. Um, <laughs> and I see online that there's been a shooting at LAX. You know, there was the, it was one of these things that happened where somebody had come, came into the terminal and it was unclear what was going on, but there was like active shooter situation. And we're on a flight to LAX. And I see, I see this, the entire plane is asleep, even the flight attendants are kind of conked out. So I get up quietly and I go up to one of the flight attendants and I say, have, have you seen what's going on at LAX where we're going right now? And she said, no. I said, well, there's a shooting at LAX. And she says, don't tell anyone. <laughs> okay, that's, <laughs> Tom Ridge taught her well. Or, um, so just don't tell anyone. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I mean, do, 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 like, do the, the pilots certainly know. Anyway, so she says, oh, I'm gonna go ask them. So she says, go sit down. I go sit down, she goes in there. And, um, and then they come back and they, they say to me, you know, don't tell other passengers about this. So, uh, uh, they say, we're going to have to make an emergency landing. We're going to go to Long Beach. All right. So Kira Sedgwick is awake, and she taps me on the shoulder, and she says, what's going on? <laughs> it's like, I'm not supposed to tell you this, <laughs> but <laughs> there's been a shooting incident at LAX, and she says, <gasps> and I said, yeah, you know, it's okay. We're going we're gonna to land at, at Long Beach Airport, and she said, oh my God, I have to tell my husband because he's gonna come and pick, her husband's Kevin Bacon. He's gonna be picking me up at LAX. And, um, and she's like, well, uh, God, how do you even get on the internet? And so she's fumbling with her phone. She can't figure out how to get on the internet. And I said, okay, well, you can, you can use my computer to email your husband. So Kira Sedgwick uses my email to email Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Kevin Bacon then emails back. So I'm the conduit between Kira Sedgwick and Kevin Bacon. You guys all know about Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Welcome to the club, Santa Fe. <laughs> You're now one degree of Kevin Bacon. Um, this has nothing to do with Nikhil Palsing. Um, but I wanted to, to lighten it up with my last experience here. Uh, 
first of all, I, I want all of us to uh, give a, a big uh, round of applause of gratitude to the Lannan Foundation, to Patrick Lannan, to all of the people that make these events possible. This is an incredibly special institution, not only here in Santa Fe, but around this country and indeed around the world. Uh, the, the literary prizes, the journalists, the authors, the poets, the artists, uh, whose work has been sponsored when they were totally unknown, uh, is a vital part of what the Lannan Foundation does. Uh, for many years, I was able to do the work that I was doing in places like Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, and Afghanistan because of the support of the Lannan Foundation. And one of... <laughs> And one of the, the, the aspects of the work of the Lannan Foundation that I respect most of all is that this foundation doesn't care what the powerful think about what voices should be heard in this society. <laughs> this community is incredibly lucky to have this series, and, and you'll see why they invited Nikhil Paul Singh uh, in a moment. Uh, but so many people have come through these very doors and stood on this stage before much of the rest of the country knew who they were. Uh, there are people that are right now being supported by the Lannan Foundation that years from now you will hear about their work. That's special. That is something special in this community. So thank you to Patrick and thank you to the Lannan Foundation for what you've built here, what you've built for artists, journalists, uh, creative people, resistors, and others here and around the world. Thank you, Patrick. We are living in such a dangerous moment right now. We're living in a moment where, I don't know how many of you saw Donald Trump's performance today, but it was simultaneously funny and frightening. And that's often the case with what we see from this administration. At the same time, given everything we know about Trump, we have to ask ourselves, why don't the Democrats have their act together? This, this is, is, is an opportunity for actual transformative change in this country in the form of real resistance and a calling to account of what does it mean to be an opposition party when you have an authoritarian who is empowering from the most powerful podium in the world white supremacists and neo-Nazis and encouraging, openly encouraging uh, racism, racist violence at times. What does it say that the people in Washington that claim to be the opposition can't seem to get their act together, their spine stiff enough to resist this administration? It says we are in a crisis. The empire, the US empire, is not in a crisis because of Trump. The empire is actually doing what it's always done. In fact, if you look at the major foreign policy areas of this administration and its priorities, you will find that the elite of the Democratic Party support Donald Trump and his administration at almost every turn when it really matters on a foreign policy level. Are the Democrats and the Republicans the same? No. Is the Supreme Court composition something that's going to impact the lives of everyone in this room and, and, and children that you don't even have yet? Yes, yes it is. There, there are differences. Would Hillary Clinton have tried to nominate someone like Judge Brett Kavanaugh? No, she wouldn't have. But, but that's not a political strategy to, to be fighting against something. You have to be about something. And, and the Democrats are gonna be asking all of us in November and in 2020 to support this idea that we're, we're worthy of your support because we're not Trump, or we assume your support because we're not Trump. That's not good enough for real thinking people. That's not good enough for fighting people. This is like one long bad episode of The Handmaid's Tale with Trump and Mike Pence, a man who as vice president cannot be alone in a room with a woman and who calls his own wife mother. The, 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 it, it is, they're, they're, the onion has now taken to just directly quoting Trump administration people. They're becoming an actual news source now because it's not, 
as dark as they, as they could even imagine in a fictitious world. It is darker. They quote Nikki Haley saying that the United States will no longer stand for a world in which Iran exists. I mean, that's basically what she's saying. So when, 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 when we're faced with that, we have to ask ourselves serious questions uh, as people who believe in justice, as people who actually believe that part of what makes us human is that we spend our time on this earth struggling, we have to find a way to break the duopoly in this country as it currently exists. Look at what happens in these elections where you have progressive Democrats challenging uh, establishment, old school, elite Democrats. The elite of the Democratic Party has stepped in to intervene against the very people that they claim they wanted to run, women, people of color, young people, LGBTQ candidates, in almost every race where you saw people that were not old white men running, the Democratic Party establishment intervened to help the old school white men. That era has to end or the Democratic Party has to end. Our guest tonight, our featured speaker, Nikhil Paul Singh, is one of the most brilliant academics who speaks the language of the street who speaks the language of the people that I've seen in our time. He reminds me of, of a combination of a street boxer and a learned professor. And it's a powerful combination in a time such as this, but he's not just in the classroom. He also was the founding director of the NYU Prison Education Program, which is doing something so incendiary and revolutionary in this society. They are working with prisoners to attain their degrees, and some of them even actually then go to the hallowed halls of NYU. It is radical to work with prisoners who then are gonna come back into society, and they're going to have that lived experience of being stuck in the carceral system of the empire. It's a revolutionary thing for a professor to do. It's an incredible commitment to the absolute forgotten of this society. Nikhil is also a professor of social and cultural analysis and history at NYU, and he's the author of some excellent books. Uh, one of them, which I interviewed him about when it came out on our show, Intercepted, is called Race and America's Long War. And another book that is for uh, many people who've been following Nikhil's work, already a classic, it's called Black as a Country, Race and the Unfinished Struggle for democracy. Nikhil Paul Singh is not going to come up to here tonight and blow smoke at you. He's going to tell you how it is, and most importantly, and we say this all the time on our show, he's going to show you why history matters, why context matters, and why facts matter. Please join me in giving a warm Santa Fe welcome to Professor Nikhil Paul Singh. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm extremely honored to be here, and thank you to the Lennon Foundation and to the whole staff for, for bringing me here and making this such a wonderful visit. Um, thanks also to Jeremy, my warm-up act. Uh, I'm not the kind of stand-up comic that he is, but you know how serious Jeremy is, and, and I'm really, really grateful to Jeremy for uh, the conversations we've had at The Intercept, and I'm looking forward to our conversation after uh, my talk tonight. Um, so I want to begin uh, by just saying a couple things about history. Uh, and they're in some ways very obvious things. Uh, we are the products of our past, and not knowing that past condemns us to repeat it. It's been said by a very famous uh, theorist of the nation state that nations live and survive by forgetting. And that's Ernst Renan, who wrote around the turn of the 20th century. But what Renan didn't say was that forgetting is usually about covering over a crime. It's usually a prerogative of privilege. And some are compelled to remember, usually those who are the victims of those societies that 
go on in their continued forgetting and covering over and laundering of the crimes they have committed. And obviously, I say this to you tonight at a very powerful moment in which that is exactly what is at stake in the confirmation hearings that are going on for the US Supreme Court. Will we be allowed to remember? Will those who have been traumatized be allowed to be heard? Will their stories get told? Or will they once again be covered over, silenced, forgotten? This is what's at stake right now. And I think we have an incredible opportunity because we know so much more now than we did before. Now, when I talk about forgetting, I'm not just talking about what's in the past, but about ignoring what has been hidden in plain sight. What has been hidden in plain sight? This is a country that has been involved in a forever war. Most of my students at NYU do not know a time when the, the country has not been at war. And yet, nobody talks about it. It's, a, it's as if sometimes it's not even happening. We live in a country that has built the largest penal complex in human history. And yet, do we see the prisons? Do we see the damage that's done to the communities from which people in prison are taken? And we live in an ecology that is under siege. I was reading about the rivers flowing out of North Carolina into the sea, and it's visible from NASA, the, the, from space, from NASA cameras, the effluvia of hog feces and chicken parts and coal ash that's flowing into the Atlantic Ocean as we speak. And yet, it is all hidden in plain sight. And it is all part of the accumulated wreckage of what we have not been allowed to see and know and remember. And last, of, of course, we face uh, the, the cultures of corruption and impunity extending from elite dorm rooms to corporate boardrooms to judicial chambers that are now being exposed if we are willing to see what has happened and draw the right conclusions from it. Now, clearly, we have a president who embodies all of this and more. But at the outset, at least, I don't want to dwell on Trump. I want to think longer and harder about how we got here. What are the arcs of history that define our present state of forgetting? The first arc that I will, I will speak about is the arc that begins with the founding of the United States. And it's an arc that also begins with slavery, with land theft, and with colonization. In the early republic, 25% of the population are African slaves. In many ways, the American Revolution is less about the vaunted freedom from taxation without representation than about the freedom to accumulate more slaves, the freedom to dispossess more of the indigenous land than was allowed under the British crown. And what we see at the origins of the American Republic is the acceleration of both the processes of slavery both the overseas slave trade, which is going to be in its waning decades, the beginning of an internal slave trade, which is going to last through the Civil War, and the relentless land hunger that is going to drive westward expansion. 10 out of the first 12 American presidents owned slaves. And these really are the things that we didn't learn, or at least I didn't learn, in my history books, and I know there are a lot of students here tonight, and I hope you're learning some of this, because this is an important part of what we need to know, not, again, to condemn or even to litigate the past, but to understand how the past is palpably present in so many ways, how these errors and crimes continue to shape and inform the society that we live in.
This country was founded on two great crimes that in turn engendered a long inner war. And that inner war is at the foundation of the history of American policing and the history of American militarism that we still are bedeviled with today. Thomas Jefferson, the author of the great charter of American freedom, had this to say about slaveholding and slaves. We can neither hold on to him nor safely let him go. Slavery, he said, is like a wolf that we have by the ear. We can neither hold on to him nor safely let him go. Justice on one scale, self-preservation on the other. And American slaveholders and American politicians ever since Jefferson have been choosing self-preservation over justice. They continue to hold the wolf by the ear and they continue to make the wrong choice. And oftentimes when people talk about the past, they say, well, that's just how it was then. These were the standards of the time and so on and so forth. And we can't judge these men and, and sometimes women by the, stand, by the standards of the present. But the thing is, is if you read the archives of the past, if you read the words of these men, mostly men, mostly white men, they knew they were committing crimes. In a letter to Jefferson, John Jay wrote, the Indians are being killed by our people in cold blood and no satisfaction given, nor are they pleased with the avidity with which we acquire their land. They knew that crimes were being committed in their name, and yet they chose to hold the wolf for fear of losing themselves. We are sometimes told that the United States has never been an empire. I don't know if you remember this, but right after the launching of the Iraq War in 2003, Donald Rumsfeld was asked by a reporter, is this an imperial action? He said, empire? We have never been an empire. I don't know why you would even ask the question. And it's one of those great formulations, because essentially what Rumsfeld does is not even say, not only say that we have never been an empire, but to rule out the validity of even asking the question. These, this is what I mean by the layers upon layers of forgetting, sanctioned forgetting, sanctioned ignorance about who we are. But if we think about this arc, this first arc that goes through slavery and settlement and colonization, what we see is that even at the end of the, the closing of the frontier, at the end of the 19th century, the United States then embarks on a new history of expansionism into the Caribbean and the Pacific. Almost immediately following the last Indian Wars, the US would go on to fight the first major colonial counterinsurgency of the 20th century in the Philippines, which leaves some one million Filipinos dead over the course of a decade, a little over a decade, and introduced some things into the lexicon of, of military tactics, uh, such as torture. And what was the torture that was favored in the US-Philippine War? I wonder if anyone knows. The water cure. The water cure, which is essentially waterboarding. It, it engenders huge public outcry. Hearings are held about war crimes. This is what I mean about being condemned to repeat. I never learned about the Philippine War until I went to graduate school. Expansion into the Caribbean and the Pacific created a whole new map making craze. And the maps, if you look at geography textbooks from the early 20th century, show something called Greater America. And they're really something to behold. There's a wonderful book coming out, coming out about this in, uh, in a few weeks. Um, and in Greater America, what you see is the Philippines, parts of the Caribbean, the hemisphere over which the, Ameri uh, over which the United States reigned as a kind of informal imperial power. And even in 1940, when the population of the United States was 132 million people, it held some 20 million people outside the United States in these overseas territories. 
in a state of subjection. Combine that with the 12 million African Americans held in second class citizen and the millions of Mexicans and indigenous people and Asians who are ineligible to become citizens or in various states of alienage. And you're still looking at a situation in which about 25% of the country, much like the founding, is in a state of subjection, governed without their consent. That, in my view, is the definition of what it means to be an empire. So 1940 is not that long ago. So if we're talking about something in the distant past, we're seeing how it carries forward. So that brings me to my second historical arc. And this will be somewhat more familiar to all of us. And that's the historical arc that begins with what we call the post-war period. Post-war. It's a funny kind of euphemism. We all know what we're talking about, right? World War II, the post-war. It's, it's an interesting formulation because we think we live in the post-war, but we live actually in the permanent war. And yet we narrate it back always to this moment of World War II. And why do we do that? Because World War II is thought of as a good war, perhaps the last good war that the United States actually fought, although Jeremy and I have had a conversation about that, and maybe we'll, we'll revisit it later. But one of the reasons World War II is thought of as a good war is because it was a war that was fought against a monstrous evil, namely Nazi Germany. And it was a war that was fought in the name of democracy. And it was a war that was fought with the promise that we were entering a period in which there would be new norms of world behavior. Some of the documents that come out of that war are some of the greatest documents of the 20th century. The Atlantic Charter, which promises self-determination for all peoples. The New Deal Bill of Rights, in which the Roosevelt administration promises to build on the New Deal with a, a promise of guaranteed health care, housing, and employment for all Americans. A universal declaration of human rights as a charter for all the world's people, and a document that's meant to stand against the evils of racism. There's even what the US administration called in the run-up to World War II a good neighbor policy towards Latin America, where there's a recognition that the history of military intervention and gun, gunboat diplomacy is now illegitimate. Sumner Wells, who's the Under Secretary of State in World War II, uses this exact phrase in 1942. He says, we are witnessing the death of white supremacy on the planet. That is 1942. That's a US State Department official making that pronouncement about the collapse of the French Empire in Southeast Asia, the collapse of the Dutch Empire, the impending collapse of the British Empire and saying there's a new world a coming. The new world a coming was a book written by Roy Otley, who was an African-American journalist in Harlem. The new world a coming was going to be the world that saw the end of fascism, the end of colonialism, and the end of racism. These were the promises that came out of World War II. And even imperial statesmen like Henry Stimson, who was the Secretary of War during World War II, uh, who wrote a very interesting essay right at the end of the war called The Challenge to Americans, said we are entering a period in which the United States must have a new relationship with the world and a new relationship to itself and to its own history. But not so fast. So what happens? Well, of course, before the ink was dry on the Atlantic Charter, and you can go to the archives and see these notations that Winston Churchill, a co-signatory co with Franklin Roosevelt, made in the margins, not to apply to the dominions of the British Empire. <laughs> and then if you read the charter, one of the interesting things about it is 
We all know it as the document that promises self-determination. Of course, these exceptions are going to be smuggled in. But you don't know, probably, that the fourth point of the Atlantic Charter, and maybe you'll fact check me on that, and it's not exactly four, maybe it's five, is the access of all nations to all the resources of the Earth. So what is that about? That's about we're going to be, con we're going to be able to continue in spite of the prospects of self-determination to be able to get what we need for our capitalist machine. Now, within the US, there's a still deeper debate about the nature of post-war power. Henry Stimson, who's getting quite old and has witnessed the dropping of the atomic bomb on the Japanese and is filled with remorse and regret about it, enters a cabinet meeting with Harry Truman right after Roosevelt's death. And he says to Truman, we must share information about nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union. If we don't do so, we will encourage an arms race of a feverish and desperate character. And, and Stimson goes on to say, the only way to make someone trustworthy is to trust them. It's a really remarkable moment. Henry Wallace, who was at that time the Secretary of Commerce, and who had been the Vice President before he was ousted in the Roosevelt administration, in the second, third Roosevelt administration, called it the most dramatic cabinet meeting in all his years in Washington. Wallace argued for Stimson's position, as did Dean Acheson, although Acheson would later recant his position. The person that opposed them, though, was the Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal. And this is what Forrestal said. And this was the argument that won the day. He said, the Russians are essentially like the Japanese. They are oriental in their thinking. And they are only attuned to the language of force. The bomb and the knowledge that produced it are the property of the American people. And Forrestal went on to make another similar kind of argument about the Japanese-mandated islands that the United States had won during the war. He said, these islands must be kept in perpetuity, for they were won through our blood. And so here you have the moment where you've promised the end of colonialism and the end of white supremacy, and what are you doing? You are seizing new colonies, which are then going to be the staging ground for American nuclear testing for the next decade at the expense of all the Pacific Islanders who live across that region. It's Forrestal's protege, George Kennan, who would author the single most influential policy leading to almost half a century of Cold War. And the policy, of course, is known under the term containment. But underneath the containment of the Soviet Union, Kennan offered a more brutal and frank rationale. And he said this in a policy memo that he uh, authored in 1948. We have 50% of the world's wealth and 6.3% of its population. Our task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our security. Now, does that sound like self-determination? Does that sound like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Does that even sound like a New Deal Bill of Rights? No, it doesn't sound like any of those things. The aspirational dreams of a society centered on the demands of the demos, which actually both the United States and the Soviet Union promised in different ways, is going to be truncated and traduced in this new great power rivalry. Of course, these forms of power engendered resistance much as slavery engendered abolition and settlement engendered the continued fight for the line as the struggle for native sovereignty was often described. 
and as colonialism engendered anti-colonial insurgencies. After World War II, aspirations for freedom accelerated and won important victories. The long civil rights movement that begins with the struggle to integrate war industries in the United States in 1941, it'll take 20 years, but it will win significant victories. The decolonization struggles, which are going to start even before World War II. And you remember that important moment where Ho Chi Minh sends telegrams to the Truman administration saying, we expect, in light of the Atlantic Charter, that the United States will be on our side in our struggle against the French. Of course, that didn't turn out to be the case. The United States is already ferrying French combat troops, many of whom had collaborated with the Nazis, back to Southeast Asia in 1946. And American sailors who want to come home are saying, what are we doing? But the Vietnamese would mount 20 years of resistance in a, another long war that they eventually won and won their sovereignty. This is a period in which social democratic experiments to expand the boundaries of the welfare state, to make it responsive again to the needs of people, to their health, to their, to their uh, ability to find gainful employment, to their long-term uh, uh, longevity after they can no longer work. These promises are also being expanded and won in part through the labor movement and the civil rights movement. And of course, most of all in many ways, coming out of all of these movements, especially in the United States, is the struggle for gender equality and sexual equality, which is going to reach a kind of, kind of a new intensity in, in the context of the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s, but which we are clearly still struggling to live out the promise of. In fact, we might note, and this is always something I tell my students, and it's always something that I think, again, puts into context something about where we are in the present, that the United States only actually became a liberal democracy in 1965 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. That's only a little more than 50 years ago. So when we think of this country in the kind of American exceptionalist idiom as the greatest democracy in the history of humanity, what are we really talking about? In light of what I've said before about the previous arcs of history, that doesn't really get borne out. In 1965, maybe the claim begins to have some plausibility. You finally ended a century and a half of commitment to black subjugation. You finally ended a century and a half commitment to whites only immigration policy. This is a pivotal moment, obviously, for the country. It's the moment in which I was born, not in the United States, but in India. And my parents uh, emigrated here three years later under a more favorable immigration law. But when we think of the brevity of America's experiment with liberal democracy, then maybe it puts in light, into a better light and a clearer light, some of the challenges we are facing now. For the counter-revolution that men like Forrestal and Kennan envisioned at the end of World War II was only just gathering steam. What had led the US into the war in Vietnam had obviously engendered a tremendous resistance as well. But in the war in Vietnam, many of the hopes and dreams of, civil, of the civil rights movement, of welfare state expansion, of changing the course of the history of the United States also ran aground. This was the moment, I think, where we got one of the most profound diagnoses of what ails us. Martin Luther King Jr. at the end of his life argued that the United States had been on the wrong side of world revolution. And he said that the promises of the great society, which was Johnson's experiment to expand the welfare state, 
and particularly to bring Southern blacks who had been excluded from the first New Deal into a broader conception of uh, the social welfare project. But the war, in many ways, put an end to all of that. And when King came out against the war in 1967, one year to the day before he was shot down, he pronounced on what he called the interrelated evils in American society, racism, materialism, and militarism. Racism, materialism, militarism. The first, the direct descendant of the slave past. The second, perhaps we could say, the product of a country driven by a dispossessive land hunger. And the third, part of the legacy of America's overseas colonization. He was saying that we are still living out this arc of history now in a new form, in a new moment. And he left a challenge that I think still constellates the present that we still have not met. But at that very moment, the counter-revolutionary project of the right was also in its ascendancy. And the wars that had been fought abroad would now come home with a vengeance. One of the things we begin to see at the end of the 60s and in the early 70s is the coalescence of a series of arguments about what was wrong with American society. And the, that series of arguments is going to shape, in many ways, the world that we now live in. Samuel Huntington, who was a political scientist and a very important uh, contributor to the Vietnam War, made a report to the Trilateral Commission in the early 1970s, where he described what he called an excess of democracy. The people, Huntington wrote, no longer felt the same obligation to obey those they previously considered superior to themselves in age, rank, status, expertise, character, and talents. Huntington lamented the days when it was possible to, quote, govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. He wrote this down. I'm not making it up. And it was a high-level report, OK? A high-level report. So Huntington had a di the diametrically opposite reading of the significance of the 1960s. Not that the United States had finally, at last, become a liberal democracy, but that becoming a liberal democracy was itself a problem for ruling the empire going forward. Too many people were starting to have too many expectations about their entitlement to be heard, to be fed, to be listened to, to be recognized in the public square. This was a problem for Huntington. Lewis Powell, soon to be named by Richard Nixon to the US Supreme Court, had much the same idea. And in a memo to the US Chamber of Commerce in 1973, he called for a business counteroffensive against the, 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 the challenges to authority that had emerged throughout the decade, but particularly the unrest and unruliness that had been shown by organized labor and by an emerging environmental movement. If you go back and read Powell's memo, he is particularly alarmed by one book, a book by Charles Wright called The Greening of America. And he's really made crazy by it. He says, you know, we've got to stamp this out. This is a huge problem for us. And he, it's a very sober and thoughtful memo otherwise, and it's really plotting a strategy. In 1968, there were 100 corporate log lobbying offices in Washington, D.C. By the middle of the 1980s, there were 1,200. Powell's message was heated. And we now also know that Exxon and corporations like it had already understood the climate science of global warming in the 1970s. And much as just like big tobacco covered up the evidence of the carcinogenic 
impact of smoking cigarettes, the big petroleum companies covered up the fact of human, the human contribution through burning fossil fuels to irreversible and damaging climate change. And that's in the 1970s. And that is something that comes out of the work of someone like Powell, who, who of course then goes on to sit on the Supreme Court. The third piece of the counteroffensive was not articulated by an avowed national security intellectual or conservative. This was a champion, a liberal champion in many ways, of the labor movement uh, and of uh, even the civil rights movement to some degree in his, in his early years. And that was Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And Moynihan made two great contributions to the counter-revolutionary, counter-offensive to the 1960s. The policy, which he named benign neglect. We spent too much time talking about the Negro problem. Too much time, he says, in 1965, when you've just granted the civil rights legislation after a century and a half of black subjugation. And he says, you know what? Racism is not so much of a problem anymore. The real problem is the tangle of pathology in the black family that is perpetuated, perpetuating itself without any assistance from the white world. This is Moynihan's thesis in 1965. And not only does he talk of a tangle of pathology, he says it is creating forms of antisocial behavior and irrational lashing out at legitimate authority that is going to, be, that is going to need to be dealt with more harshly in the coming period. So already, just at the moment, when you have civil rights victories, you have a subset of liberal opinion making the argument for a punitive turn in social policy. Moynihan has a second act, because in 1975, he is the ambassador to the United Nations, where he authors a piece called The United States in Opposition. And he makes a very similar argument to the argument he makes about benign neglect towards African Americans struggling for freedom and equality to the third world. He says, we've been criticized too much in this forum. It's time for us to take the gloves off and to show these, these underdeveloped and developing countries just who's the boss. We think of unilateralism in American policy as beginning with Trump, or maybe we think back to George W. Bush. But in fact, we need to go back to this earlier moment, because this is the moment in which you have a trajectory towards the kind of unilateralism that we're seeing now. And of course, uh, one of the great figures who played many sides in this game, Henry Kissinger, at the very moment that Moynihan is talking about uh, the United States in opposition, helping to engineer a coup in Chile. And this is what Kissinger said about the coup in Chile, which overthrew the elected government of Salvatore Allende, a socialist, and led to the, 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 the military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. In some ways, this quote from Kissinger for me brings together all of these strands. I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its people. <laughs> the issues are much too important for the, Chile, for the Chilean voter to be left to decide for themselves. These sharp right turns come together in the Reagan administration. And the Reagan administration it marks a ratcheting up of the Cold War again, what some commentators have described as a second Cold War. It marks a new period of covert action and hemispheric intervention. No more good neighbor policy. And of course, it marks the beginning of the dirty wars that Jeremy has written about so brilliantly that the US is still fighting in the Middle East and South Asia. Does anybody remember the peace dividend? For a half century of Cold War, me neither. <laughs> 
Instead, on top of a bloated military industrial complex, we set about building a new prison industrial complex. And that started with the launching of the wars on crime and the wars on drugs. And the fact that the language of war was now going to be applied to America's own internal population in many ways tells you everything you need to know. We were still fighting the inner war. The inner wars that were at the founding of this country were renewed. And it wasn't just Nixon and Reagan, even Lyndon Johnson in the late 1960s, in response to conservative pressure uh, and the upsurge in street crime, which did in fact happen, said we are now fighting a war within our own boundaries. This is all part of a punitive turn. And it, and it, and it, and it takes over. It takes over from the, the more pro progressive and inclusive trajectories that are coming out of the 60s and it begins to solidify a new common sense. And these were the years in which someone named Donald J. Trump first burst on the scene, talking about a world that cheated Americans and demanding an even harsher version of law and order politics. You remember his first, very first political act was taking out a full page ad in the Daily News calling for the execution of five African-American boys who were wrongly accused, it turns out, of raping a white woman in Central Park. And Trump called for their death. He still, even in, their, in, in, the, in the revelations that have come since, uh, never admitted uh, that he was wrong. Trump is all of it, really. He's the reactionary business ethic. He's unilateral militarism. He's hostile to a diverse demos, and he embraces the extractive mania of environmental deregulation. He represents, in some ways, all the worst aspects of our history, and they have all, in many ways, coalesced to all of our horror. But, be, but I don't necessarily want to end on this note. We live at the end. I think, of this third arc. Trump is not the beginning of something new. He's the end of something, OK? He's the end of something. <laughs> what, what we live at the end of is undeniably a world in distress and, to some extent, in ruin. Four trillion dollars of forever war, a national debt fueled by tax cuts, whose interest payments will soon exceed the already bloated military budget, an ecology whose fragility is still denied, and of course, the mass incarceration regime that has ground up and spit out tens of millions of people over the last three decades, decimating entire communities. Even just looking at the United States alone, there's a tremendous amount of salvage work to be done. And I use the word salvage because I think that we have to recognize the ruins that we live amongst and not believe in the kind of techno-optimist quick fixes that, that, that something's going to come along and magically save us. But we are at the end of an arc. We are at the end of an arc. It is easy to fall prey to pessimism and despair, but it is not where I want to leave you. Frederick Douglass, the great freed slave, the great escaped slave and a freedom orator and abolitionist, used the very famous slogan, which you've probably heard before, without struggle, there is no progress. Without struggle, there is no progress, and we've seen it throughout our history. We have a system that generates enormous wealth and technological advance without commensurate improvements in our ethical and spiritual faculties. This is why another great freedom fighter, Martin Luther King, at the end of his life, called for a radical revolution in values. And we are still waiting for that radical revolution in values. But even in these dark years of permanent war and mass incarceration, we have seen a mass deportation. We have seen great movements on our horizon. 
I don't know, probably many of you in this room were, have, been, have been marching for 20 years. We marched in the millions against the Iraq war. We didn't, we didn't stop that war from happening, but the marching we did mattered. It created the context for the discrediting of that war and the entire project it represents. Millions three years later marched for immigrant rights and the rights of the undocumented. Millions, the bigger, perhaps the biggest labor march in the history of the United States. That legacy is still within, still with us even though so many have been forced back into the shadows by the deportation mania. We live amidst a new and profound upsurge of demands for economic fairness and health security. And of course, there's the movement for black lives. And the movement for black lives taps in to the whole long history that I've been describing today. We are ready to begin a new historical arc, and the forces arrayed against this should not be overestimated. Bring on the excess of democracy. The future demands it, and we must finally become a decent country among the peoples of the world. Thank you.